Um, I want to thank our speaker, Claire Lewis. Um, thank her for donating her time and sharing her expertise. She's been with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program since 2011, so that's 10 years now. Um, her current title is Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, Statewide Florida Friendly Communities Coordinator for the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, IFAS Extension. Um, prior to joining the, the Florida Friendly Landscaping team, she earned a Master's of Landscape Architecture degree from the University of Florida and worked 12 years for private landscape architecture firms in Gainesville. Her design projects included large scale commercial institution, institutional and residential home sites. Claire's current job responsibilities include educational outreach to local governments, building professionals, and community decision makers across the state to provide educational programming to Floridians about sustainable landscape practices and to encourage builders, developers, and HOAs to implement the Florida Friendly Landscaping principles in their communities in order to preserve and protect Florida's water and natural resources. So, um, Claire, I will let you share your screen and start your presentation. Okay. Do you want me to stop your screen sharing? Yes. Okay. Um, you should be able to. Yeah, it, it let yeah. me do that. Um, uh, you... And I'm going to launch the first poll before you. Okay. And are you seeing my full screen? Are you seeing where my. Yes, I'm, okay. full, I'm seeing it full screen. Okay, perfect. Um, and you're going to. So, yeah. So here's the first poll. Oh, so we're evenly split, 50-50. Okay. Great. Great. Right. Well, I'm, really, I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you for that introduction. I should probably shorten my bio. <laughs> it's a little hard to hear about yourself. <laughs> um, and um, I, I have been with the program for a while now, and I've, I've had a couple of different positions and um, I'm looking forward to the position I'm in now. It's kind of a new position where we're really trying to branch more out into the builders and developers and, and local governments. And um, we're funded through um, DEP and they've recently taken a very active role. And so there's some things that are coming up that are pretty exciting where we've launched, we're gonna have a TV show and it's called Flip My Florida Yard. Um, and it's kind of, designed after one of those HGTV shows, you know, where the people leave and they come back and their yard is transformed. So that's pretty fun. It's gonna be some more um, marketing and, and just more presence, I think, of Florida Friendly in the future now. So, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and so today I'm gonna talk um, about some strategies that, that we, um, you know, like to let people know for, for homeowners and HOA board members to work together to create um, healthy and environmentally friendly landscapes. Um, and I'll go through these slides and, um, and we'll, I guess, take questions at the end, if that's, that's all right with everybody. So what I'd like to kind of reiterate is that Florida Friendly, it's a science-based um, approach to maintaining an attractive, diverse and more sustainable landscape. And so I like to bring this up just to, to reinforce the idea that everything that we say, we can't say it unless it has been scientifically proven. So, um, so that, you know, just to know where we're coming from. And then the goals are to protect um, water quality and conserve water. Um, so we're more of a, we're funded through this non-point source pollution money, not, you know, and we're not as much about aesthetics, um, but they do, you know, that is an important part of the Florida Friendly Program as well. Um, and so the mission is to educate Floridians about science-based environmentally friendly landscaping practices um, and to encourage them to protect 
the environment by using these nine principles um, in their landscapes. And, and, and a lot of it is really about how they maintain their landscapes. But these are the nine principles. Um, and hopefully um, you all have, have heard of these principles or seen them before. Um, I'm not going to go into each one. Um, the, the, the big one is right plant, right place. And we really say that's the cornerstone of our program because um, once you get the, the right plant in the right place, and oftentimes the native plant is you know, the right plant in the right place, but once it's the right plant in the right place, then there's a lot less inputs that need to be um, applied to make it really thrive in that location. Um, so we always go back to right plant, right place because it reduces the amount of water, it reduces the amount of, of pests that you're gonna have, it reduces the amount of, um, of, you know, fertilizer that you may need to apply to it. So, um, you know, right plant, right places is, is the key. So those nine principles, um, it, you know, they're the foundation of the program, um, but the, the Florida Friendly Program has three sub-programs. And um, that's the Florida Yards and Neighborhoods Program, the Florida Friendly Communities Program, and the Green Industries Program. And you can see the bullets underneath them. Each of them has their own target audience, but we still teach those same nine principles that I just showed you. It's just targeted to a different audience. And, and um, you know, um, just, you know, uh, I guess just targeted towards each audience. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about the statutes. And um, so the Florida Friendly Landscaping Legislation is in um, the, the Florida State Statute 373.185. Um, and then the GIBMP is also written into the Florida State Statute. Um, and that's chapters 482.156 and 403. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the 373 and really what I want you to take home from that is that this legislation um, is one that impacts local governments, HOAs, and residents. It, it defines Florida friendly as quality landscapes that conserve water, protect the environment, and are adaptable to local conditions and are drought tolerant. The legislation states that local government ordinances, deed restrictions, or covenants may not prohibit Florida-friendly landscaping practices. And I believe you had another speaker who came up and, and spoke about that. There, there is a caveat to that, though, and the statute does not invalidate HOA architectural control and landscape committee decisions. Homeowners can implement FFL as long as they comply with their code restrictions and gain approval from their appropriate committees before they make changes to their landscape. Um, and in addition, the homeowners associations, they can require certain things, certain elements of the Florida Friendly Landscape to be related to either a side yard or a backyard. Um, so they, it's, it hasn't given up all control for HOA board um, or, or local government um, code enforcement. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier um, at the beginning of this, um, we're a science-based program. And as such, we're always you know, researching and trying to learn more. And so I'm gonna talk about a couple of the research projects that, that we, a couple of the recent research projects that we've been working on. And the first one is, is um, it's the fluid friendly landscape plots. And we studied water use. We also studied um, other inputs. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But it was set up to mimic a, a, a person's front yard and backyard. And so there were three replicate plots. Um, each of them had the same number of plants and the same type of plants. They, they were configured a little different, um, but they were the exact same number you know, type of plant. So in this, we said that the front yard, which is this area, was a traditional landscape. And it was 75% turf grass and 25% plants. And then the Florida Friendly um, was in the backyard, and that was, you know, just the opposite. It was 25% turf grass and 75% plants. So the traditional yard was irrigated with, you know, um, what we commonly see, just, you know, a, a rotor zone in the front that waters both the turf grass and the, the landscape bed, where the Florida Friendly yard had um, water efficient um, heads irrigating the turf and micro irrigation and drip irrigation plant beds. And you can see there was, there was a significant savings, um, savings of up to 83% of the Florida friendly over the traditional. And, um, and basically what happened is after, um, 
after the first year, they were able to turn off the irrigation completely in the backyards and, and, and they, they couldn't turn it off in the front yard because it was all on rotor zone. But they could turn off all the, the irrigation to the, the, the landscape bed um, and just had to irrigate the grass. And what, one thing um, I thought was really interesting about this, once the three years were up, um, I went and I visited the landscape um, and then they were kind of using it for different things. They were doing some other turf grass trials and things. Um, <clears throat> but so the turf area, you know, they turned off the irrigation and so the turf all died. It just looked terrible, but the plants were still looking great. Um, <laughs> and um, so I think that's a real testament um, to, you know, the, the, the idea of, you know, really decreasing turf grass. And, and so this publication, it will be, it's going to be in a journaled article, hopefully this year. It's been in the works for a while now, but from what I understand, it's very close to being published, which I'll, I'll be real happy about that because I'll, you know, we can start to really advertise this more, you know, um, actively. But um, so, as I said, you know, we measured all these different things in the landscape. Um, and we, you know, measured how much fertilizer was applied, um, any kind of maintenance activity, if there's any herbicide. Um, and you can see that the darker is the traditional Florida yard. And then the, the lighter um, columns here are the Florida friendly. So there, it was pretty much um, a wash between the mowing of the traditional landscape and the hand weeding of Florida friendly um, landscape. And what I would think is that over, over time, once those um, landscape plants mature and grow in, that the um, weeding requirements will go down um, after the plants are you know, fully established. Um, and Melanie, yeah. Yeah. So Can everyone see that poll? I see it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yep. Um, okay. Well, assume everyone's finished, but all of those are benefits. Um, one, one of the things that always interests me is how much um, air pollution mowers make. Um, they say that running a mower for one hour creates 11 times more air pollution than running a car for one hour. So, um, so that's kind of an interesting statistic. Sure is. Okay. Okay, I'll continue on. I, I think it's, I don't know why I do this, but when I'm on the phone, oh, no, we can see. Oh, I was just, those are the, just the results. Uh -huh. Okay. I have this habit whenever I'm on the phone, I go outside and, and um, I have these little, I weed <laughs> while I'm on the phone. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's nervousness or what, but, um, <clears throat> excuse me. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is a, a publication that was the estimated water savings of potential of, potential of Florida friendly landscaping activities. And um, we did this to kind of help predict the impact of the program and help guide people um, in making decisions and you know what they're going to do in their landscape. So this table is from that document, and um, it shows you, for example, that if you converted a turf grass area to a landscape bed with micro irrigation, you can expect to save between 15 and 31,000 gallons of water per 1,000 square feet per year. So, um, so that's, that's a pretty interesting fact. And that's useful to kind of help decide what activities that you or your community are going to implement. There's also some easier things like just, you know, skipping a week in the, in the, the winter or reducing the frequency in the summer. And you can see some numbers associated with doing those activities. Um, 
Um, we also did another research study recently, and um, it was getting people's perception of how they felt about different you know, landscapes. And, and they were calling these more alternative landscapes with, with um, more plant material. <clears throat> and so they could pick, you know, they asked them to pick which one they liked better. Um, this was 75% turf or 25% plants, 50-50, 75-25 and zero 100. And yeah, we'd like to see what you all think. <laughs> so there are the results for this group. That's nice. Um, I, I tend to, to like this one too. Um, the most popular were, um, was really 50% 50, 50 was the most popular. Um, and this was done, um, you know, for not plant enthusiasts. So, so I would certainly think um, people like us who, who like plants would like to see more plants. <laughs> um, but general public, I was really happy to see that, that they did like, you know, the 50-50 split. Um, and then one more that we're going to talk about here, one more research study that I'm going to talk about is, um, is this focus group we did. And in an effort to be proactive in preventing these legal disputes regarding the FFL legislation that I talked about earlier, um, we held a series of focus groups across the state to try to find the differences and the commonalities of HOA board members versus the residents and um, try to find where we could agree and where we could compromise and, and how we can move together. Because um, there's been quite a few disputes. And, uh, um, you know, and, you know, not real happy endings either. Um, not sure if I have this in my presentation. Um, but we do a we do a workshop at least once a year with an attorney who comes, and um, she, she you know so she represents homeowners who've who've been in a dispute with their HOA about their Florida friendly yard, and she said you know even if they end up coming out on top of the dispute, they they end up with a really negative um, opinion um, of their neighborhood and you know there may be animosity between them and their neighbors and just it's it doesn't it, you know it doesn't usually end well for anybody the neighbors are mad at them because they've you know, maybe their HOA fees have been raised because of the legal disputes or um, you know maybe they don't like the way the landscape looks so really if we could I always when people call um, I always say you know let's try to find some you know some common ground and so that's that's what we were working for and as you can imagine, turf is, is a catalyst for differences of opinion. And, and as we look at it, turf is the common feature that provides continuity throughout an HOA community. Um, so if you can, you know, really, if you live in an HOA and you would like to become more floor, Florida friendly, keep some turf, but keep it right in front. And if you can make like a really deep curve to the bed like this, it, it makes it look like there's more turf than there really is. Um, and then you can increase your landscape bed. Um, another um, tip that, that we came up with is if you can have, you know, the smaller plants in the front and, and then the more the plants that keep a more formal shape, um, keep those in front. And then as it goes back towards the back of your house, then you can kind of get the larger plants and that have a more natural um, habit to them. So that would be another tip. Um, Another important catalyst was was weeds. Um, they, you know, they were really, a, you know, a big issue of, you know, where these disputes came from. So they re they represent this lack of care and la lack of responsibility to the community. So keeping weeds down and and um, and your landscape maintained is is big. And that leads right into this slide is that I don't think it's that people have problems with Florida friendly landscapes in particular. I think it's they have problems with they think that they won't be maintained. And um, probably this group knows that, you know, even if something's native, you still have to maintain it. And what we find is people come to us and they say, well, we put in a Florida friendly landscape. That means there's no maintenance. and We don't have to do anything. And, and you know, it, that's just not that's just not the case. Um, you still do have to maintain that landscape. 
um, if you live in an HOA. <laughs> if you don't live in an HOA, you have some other options. But um, I hope some of those tips helped. Um, this is the publication that we developed out of those focus groups that has different strategies for um, working with an HOA. Um, and it has some of the ones I talked about and a few more. Um, I can provide a link to that document because we have it online, it's available. Um, and um, so that's the 10 strategies document. We also have another document um, the frequently asked questions about landscape irrigation. Um, well, for Florida friendly landscaping, this this document goes into um, all different FAQs about Florida friendly landscaping, and um, we will talk about some of those coming up. We're gonna, I think, we're gonna launch another poll because um, there's some misconceptions. That there's quite a few misconceptions about that legislation, and. Um, and so what we hope to do is just, you know, clarify things and then, you know, that way we can move forward and, and try to um, come to a commonality in our, you know, our, our uh, rectifying those issues. So yeah, the, the poll is up. So we asked four questions. You want to? I yeah, I do. <laughs> I should stop looking at them and I'll go through. I think uh, I think everybody got them right. So, <laughs> um, so the first one is: Does the law allow homeowners to retrofit their landscapes by removing turf? And you all said no, and and it doesn't. Um, you still do have to go through that approval process. Um, I, I've had phone calls from people who are like, I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway. And, and I really try to dissuade them from doing that. Um, and uh, the next question was, can a review board tell homeowners what they can and cannot plant? And that was also yes. And, um, and you got that right. Um, so oftentimes, code, codes and deed restrictions will have a specific planting list that you have to follow. So um, if they do have that, then th you must pick from those plants. Um, and is turf Florida friendly? Um, it, yeah, it can be as long as it matches the conditions um, and it's not maintained with excessive irrigation, pesticide and fertilizer. Um, there, there are five different types of turf grass that are in our manual and um, once again, going back to those HOA deed restrictions, they can still um, require that you install St. Saint Augustine, even though there's five different types. Um, and that's, you know, a situation where we just are trying to keep educating people and letting them know that they're, you know, sometimes St. Augustine is the right plant for the right place, but sometimes it's not. And, um, and that's where we're at right now. That legislation, it just doesn't have a lot of teeth to it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I kind of answered this one before and, uh, and you got that one right too. Um, the legislation, unfortunately, just doesn't have a lot of teeth to it. And, it, and as I've been told from, from the attorney, it's because it says may not prohibit. And, um, you know, if it said shall not or something like that, it would have a lot more um, oomph to it. And it hasn't yet been um, tried. It hasn't gone to a trial in front of, you know, a judge. And um, there's been no precedent set. So the cases that have come up have been mitigated. And um, so, you know, it's, it's usually, you know, they come to an agreement and it's, you know, they, it's secret, you know, they're not allowed to tell what happened. Um, so I think one day, you know, we'll have some cases where, you know, someone has replaced their St. Augustine turf or, or maybe their Zoysia or some other kind of turf. They've, they've replaced it several times and it just won't work in that location. And that case may get taken to, you know, actual to a jury and, and, and decided. Um, and then, then that law might have a little more precedent, but it hasn't made it that far yet. Um, so that's where we're at with that legislation. 
So I'm going to talk about some some happier things, some things I, I like to talk about a little bit more than the legislation. Um, and it's some of the resources that we have available. Um, and the first one is um, our website. And I don't know if you've been to our website before, but we've just revamped it. It's got a new look to it. So this is the landing page. Um, we've, we've organized it a little differently. Um, so I, we hope that it's easier to navigate through to find the information you're looking for. You can order our publications from the website. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this plant guide, but um, there's, you know, there's example photos and you know, how to find your local extension agent. There's, there's a whole lot of information on our website and I would really encourage you to visit it. Our main publications are the, the handbook, um, the plant selection and landscape design, and the, um, the GIBMP manual. Um, and so the plant selection and landscape design, if you haven't seen it, it has, it has um, I, I think this one has over 402, as plants with their, what they need for their growing conditions. Um, has, it has some natives and, and it has just some Florida friendly plants. Um, so it has, you know, the light requirements and the water requirements and, and how big and wide they'll get and things like that. Um, and then, so, so this is really, you know, where you start. And then the, the handbook is designed for helping you maintain your landscape. So it goes through the nine principles in detail and, and um, talks about, you know, how you, you maintain your landscape according to Florida Friendly. Then we just have some, some um, guidelines, some model language for um, codes, covenants, and restrictions, um, where if a HOA community wanted to update their CCRs, they could go to this document and pull the information and, you know, modify it so it worked for their community. And this is along the same lines where it's a model landscape maintenance contract. And so if a community is looking to hire a new landscape maintenance company, um, all the latest IFAS recommendations are included in that document so they could pull that and, and use what works for their community. Um, <clears throat> is there a question? No, I think Donna just um, said that. Oh, okay. The website as a wonder is a wonderful redo. Very helpful. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. That was um that was one of the benefits of COVID, <laughs> or you know, or of the lockdown, not of COVID, but you know, of of being um, at our desk for a year, we were really able to to get through that. Um, and then so something else that I'm I'm really excited about um, is that we have a monthly webinar series, and we have it for professionals and and for homeowners. So there's there's you know, two a month. Um, and I, I do the, the professional one, um, myself and, and Tom Wickman. Um, but um, the, the homeowner webinar has some great ones. I just, she didn't have her schedule, so I couldn't share it with you. Um, but I, I'd seen it at one point, some of her ideas, and it looked like a really great lineup. Um, they're also recorded. Um, so you could watch um, ones that have already passed. Um, we just had one on Tuesday on Palm Nutrition with um, Dr. Moore, and it was it was really really informative because um, even you know palms just they're not like other plants, <laughs> and um, um, they they just require more. Um, luckily, my cabbage palms are doing just fine. Um, we also offer CEUs for these professional um, webinars. If that's if you're a member of of FNGLA or, or um, Florida Water Star or, or something like that, um, you can get CEUs. Um, so I mentioned the plant guide earlier, and that's our app. And what's really great right now is that um, it used to, we used to charge for it. So now we um, it's free. So all our apps are free. So when you go to our website, um, that would be another fun thing to check out. Our app is like the um, design guide that I talked about earlier. Um, so, you know, it, it, oh, I think I have a demonstration here. So you can search for a couple different ways, but I, I like this way, you know, you can search by plant type. And on this example, I selected ground covers um, and partial shade and native and you know that's pretty typical but um then you know it, it'll it'll filter it by your zip code um so you know the plants that will work in your area and then you know it gives you a list and then once you get that list you get the, these kind of 
this kind of information from it. And, you know, I like that it gives you a spread as well as a height. Um, so, um, and I think this is getting a facelift too, um, but it, it'll have all these attributes. We also have a butterfly garden app um, and it has both host and nectar plants. Um, it has some sample planting designs for small, medium and large butterfly gardens. And it has um, 62 Florida butterflies with information and photos. And this is, this is what I really like about it is that it shows the, um, has images of kind of the, the, the larval and the pupa and the, and, the, and the egg as well as the mature um, butterfly. So I think that's really fun. Um, and, you know, that one's free now too. We also have a, a fertilizer app um, and a toxic plant app. And we're working on a bee app. So um, there'll be a, 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 an app that's going to be very similar to the butterfly app. Um, but for bees and both the butterfly app and the bee app have a lot more natives than, than um, our in print guide. So we're happy about that. We're, we're trying to move to more natives and getting more natives in our publications. So, um, so now I'm going to kind of finish up with just talking about a few success stories of communities that have implemented Florida friendly landscaping and, um, and some of the, the success that they've achieved. So this one is in Pinellas County. And if you can see in this image here, um, it, they, uh, it, it was turf grass, right? And um, in, in front of these 26 units and the turf grass requires different watering than, than the landscape beds, right? And I think, I mean, this turf looks stressed, you know, it's probably very hot with all the concrete. Irrigation heads tend to get um, run over or, you know, just out of alignment in these, types of situations. And then this is just such a small area of turf grass that, you know, they're, they're mowing it, they're edging it, and they're irrigating it differently. So there's a lot of maintenance and a lot of inputs that are going into just this little tiny bit. So they removed that and they put, they replaced it and put it with a ground cover and installed micro irrigation. And um, they ended up saving $34,000 a year across all 26 homes. So, so that's a real significant savings. Um, and, you know, and then, you know, maintenance savings too, that's not included in that, so. So another community in, in Flagler County, now this is a really big community, right? It's a thousand acres. Um, and, and they had turf in their medians that they were, you know, having to continually replace because it kept dying. Um, and so they replaced that turf that was, you know, not the right plant in the right place if it kept dying. Um, and they replaced it with ground covers. They used a hardier annual um, rather than perennials in um, some of their landscape beds. And then they also reduced the, the rotations from four down to two. So that saved money and, and, and labor as well, um, you know, because it, once you get the um, perennials established, um, then you don't have to keep irrigating them. And then they no longer hurricane cut their palms. They were hurricane, cut, they were hurricane cutting their palms four times a year, um, which is just crazy. Um, but now they only um, just remove the dead fronds and they just do that two times a year and they save $25,000. Um, a year just on that alone. So, and that's that's an IFAS recommended practice. You guys probably know that, you know, that the hurricane cutting the palms is just not necessary. It's just something that has been kind of sold to the public that they need to do. But in fact, it's healthier for the palms to, to keep a full head. Um, so don't take anything else, take that away. <laughs> um, and here's just a nice easy one in Sumter County. Um, they, they replaced their annuals with perennials. And, um, and this was around a, um, the, the public library. So they just replanted with, with the perennials and um, they ended up saving you know, $3,000 a year. Um, and then I think this is the last one I was gonna talk about. And um, this landscaping, um, it, this is um, in Clearwater and it, this is the main entry boulevard. The landscaping, it was dated and um, the residents were saying they were beginning to have a negative impact on the perceived value of their units because of the landscaping being kind of dated and not looking so good. So a couple of the residents um, were, you know, attended a FFL workshop 
not a, there were four of the residents and they attended an FFL workshop. And um, then after that, they decided to develop the Eagles Landing Landscape Committee. And with the support of um, the extension agent um, and the landscape designer, they um, developed, you know, a whole landscape, you know, renovation project. And um, so you can see what a big difference that is. That looks so nice. And when that grows, when that, it, I think it's jasmine or something, but when that grows in, that's going to look really nice. And, um, and then this is another area as well. And so once they installed this, they were able to, um, you know, stop, you know, the, the rotor irrigation and, um, you know, installed micro irrigation. So they were saving water and, and resources that way too. Um, and they also hired GIBMP contractors to, to maintain the landscape. So those are a few kind of things that I, I hope are inspirational. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, um, please, you know, you can um, feel free to ask. Um, went through that kind of quick, but. Uh... Oh. Um, I'm trying to oh, unmute, <laughs> unmute everyone. Um, I think you did. Has have you all had any in experience with the legislation, or, or has it has it um, hopefully not been an issue? <laughs> My HOA is very minimal, so they haven't really had an issue, and I just kind of keep expanding my my beds around the house about six inches every time I edge. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm hoping it's just like not a major, like all of a sudden they notice it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to use that one in the future. You know, it's kind of that small, the small changes don't, don't yeah. get, you know, big changes. People don't like change. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question about how how do you find um, professionals who will install the micro irrigation? I don't think I don't think it's hard to it's it's actually pretty easy I think to convert to micro irrigation too and um, and that's you know that's something that the local extension office can help with. I know a lot of them have kits that they'll sell or they'll have classes. Um, and I think most irrigation contractors that, that I'm aware of can you know can do that conversion. You have to convert a whole zone, you know. So like um, if part of the zone is irrigating um, like a turf area and then a part is you know irrigating the landscape bed you have to you, you can't you can't do both like you have to it has to either be spray heads or you know like right irrigation. yeah i i had a guy come out to do some repairs and asked him about um converting one of my zones and he said oh we don't do that oh yeah with well, you know the thing, yeah, there, there is probably that too, because um, with irrigation, I think there's some hesitation for firms maybe because if you mess something up and the whole system is no longer working again, then they're kind of liable. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know I, I converted in a zone of irrigation in my house and it was pretty easy. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'll probably get in touch with the extension office and try to see if I can convert. I don't run my irrigation very often, but um, it would be nice to, you know, have the option available. Yeah, um, a lot of times people really recommend, you know, capping heads and I'm much more like just turn off that zone and only use it as you need yes. it. Because, you know, we do, we get droughty sometimes where, you know, you, you have to supplement either by hand or, or you know, somehow. Right. Um, yeah. Um, I don't remember where this woman lived, but there recently was, a, was someone who won a case, I think it was against her community 
either the city or something. So anyway, someone complained about, you know, that her yard was all weeds. And it was kind of interesting because she won the case by taking in a weed and a native plant and asking the people in the court, you know, whether they could tell the difference. <laughs> and they couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Interesting it's, outcome. It is very interesting. I mean, I and if it was in a for a, a local governmental code, their code is just usually a height issue. You know, they don't really care what it is. But if it's over twelve inches, then or eighteen inches or whatever it is, and um, that's when they start to have a problem. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. Um, any other questions? Um, another, I guess I have another question. Um, and that is if we wanted to start approaching HOAs, either, you know, individuals who are in an HOA who want to, um, you know, talk to their boards or as an organization, if we wanted to start uh, reaching, you know, doing some outreach to HOAs, do you have any advice about the best way to go about that? Yeah, it's, it's hard. You know, there's some HOAs that are really receptive um, and then others that aren't. And, um, you know, what they're worried about, I think, are those big weedy yards, you know? So showing them maybe uh, like, so the way we've tried to plug it in is, you know, like a short presentation um, in one of their established meetings already, you know, if I could have 10 minutes to talk or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, providing like, if you could provide some assistance, you know, like if they wanted to say, switch out some of their shrubs and, and install firebush or something, um, you know, letting them know how to maintain that, you know, um, or just giving them like really, I think people do better with small bits of information and, and practical is, yeah. is kind of, <laughs> um, so, you know, and making small changes and, and seeing how that goes. Um, another good thing might be to offer to install kind of a demonstration garden um, where you could just, you know, do a very small area, but show some plants that, you know, residents could consider replacing, you know, with natives and, and they could see how they perform and, and see, you know, how to maintain them and things. I, I know that's one thing that, that we've come across when um, we've done some demonstration landscapes and, and unfortunately, you know, using natives and, and some people don't, you know, know how to maintain them. Um, and if they go, you know, if they go dormant in winter and then they cut them all down and then they don't come back or, you know, there, there's, there's, I think there's a real education gap that we need for, for natives um, yeah. and how to maintain them so that. And, and actually um, next month we have our annual meeting, but in May our, um, our program is how to maintain a Florida native yard. So that should provide a lot of good practical information for, for members. I'd love to see that presentation and, too. And a, note, a note to you, Claire, um, Blanket Flower, the Gallardia, mm -hmm. is not now not considered a native anymore. Wow. Okay. Yeah, they've been arguing about that for a long time, and I guess now they've decided that it's not, not a native. Well, that's too bad. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes it, me sad. <laughs> it's still Florida friendly. <laughs> it's still Florida friendly. Yep. And and I know I've talked to Cami, you know, about native ours and 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 that too. So I know it gets to the, um, it, it, you know, it gets it gets very complicated. 
Um, yeah. Um, but, but more and more, um, I've noticed going to the native nursery, um, they have all different versions of, of plants. Um, I went to the nursery looking for a Walters viburnum, and there were five different um, versions of the plant, you know, with different growth habits. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting they're they're getting more, um, you know, giving giving people more options with native plants. And and one thing we always you know, when we talk about the nine principles in wildlife habitat, we always talk about how important the natives are for wildlife habitat um, and shoreline, things like that too. Um, yeah. In addition to just landscape plants. <laughs> well, you sure have some good information. Um, I love your new website layout. Um, I'm gonna go look at um, look at the plant and the butterfly parts of the website because those look like they're great. Well, they good. sure and do. It, awesome. And if you have a chance, try you know look at some of the webinars. Um, she should be getting the, the other webinars up online too, um, as far as what the schedule of them is. Um, but you know those you can watch on you know recorded. They're usually mm -hmm. up a week or two after they've been done. So there might there might be some good ones. I know Sandy Wilson, um, we're going to have her speak, and I, I know she spoke last year, um, and she does, you know, sh she um, does a lot. She's a native plant um, professor at, at UF that we work closely with, and she does a great presentation. You might be interested in that one. <laughs> uh, question, uh, Claire, do you work closely with Tina McIntyre? Yeah, yeah, I do. It's gotten dark in my room and I can see I'm kind of <laughs> turning into like a little floating head. <laughs> Sorry, I'd have to get up and turn on the light. So I haven't done that. <laughs> yeah, Tina's great. She, um, I, and we've got a couple of things in the works right now together. Um, but she's been, she's been a great addition. She, when did she start a couple of years ago? Maybe, God, maybe five years ago. That's not that long, right? <laughs> Uh, okay, um, any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much, Claire, for doing this for us. Um, I'm going to, I will be posting it, the recording on our um, website. So people who missed it can go and look at it and I'll also post links to um, some of your documents and your website. Okay, well, I really appreciate being invited here today. Thank you so much. It was very, very informative and I, I can't wait to check out this website more in depth. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.